come back to calcium. You talked about how the body is regulating that within a really narrow range. That, like iodine, is another one of those controversial supplements. Most people s- saying to stay away from them. How do you feel about supplementing with calcium? And then we'll go from there. Well, several things to be aware of. So if your listeners are wheat and grain free, they've eliminated the phytates, the phytates that bind calcium and other positively charged minerals like magnesium. So you get rid of the phytates because when you eat a burger with a bun or a sandwich or a bagel or whatever, pretzels, the phytates in the grains bind the calcium and you poop it out. You don't absorb it. When you get vitamin D, it enhances dramatically intestinal absorption of vitamin D. If you take steps to improve your microbiome, especially eradicate SIBO, fecal microbes that block absorption of vitamin D, and you cultivate a return of healthy microbes like lactobacillus, bifidobacteria, and others, you enhance calcium. So those of us following these kinds of lifestyle changes are hyper absorbers of calcium that you get from broccoli or kale or spinach. Those kinds of things. Another issue to be aware of, uh, evidence out of mostly Australia and New Zealand, where uh, this is observational, so it's not real solid, but it's concerning that people who take more than 500 milligrams of calcium all at once, so so so-called bolus dosing, so it's not getting, you're not getting a little calcium from broccoli, a little calcium from kale, a little calcium from maybe yogurt. In this case, you can take it as a bolus dose. So a lot of ladies will take for instance 1,200 milligrams all at once. Well, that sudden burst of calcium has been associated with an increase in cardiovascular death. And so it's a tough thing to prove, though. If I said, if I said to the ladies in the audience, all right, we're going to do a study. I'm going to give you a tablet. It may contain a high dose of calcium. It may be a placebo. And I want to see if you're, if you're more likely to die. Well, no one's going to, it's unethical. No one would do it. So th- this is, happens over and over again. When, when, the, when something bad could happen, it's really tough to prove because you can't ethically uh, do that to people, nor would people do it. And so we're left with this kind of indirect evidence that people who take more calcium appear to have, by the way, and calcium supplementation almost does nothing to increase bone density. It, it may have a modest effect in the first year, but not much after that. I would prefer to be a hyperabsorber of calcium and get calcium from whole foods, from real foods, not ultra processed foods, but whole foods like vegetables, those kinds of things. All right. To make sure I have that correct, then if we're living a healthy lifestyle, we're going to absorb more calcium from the diet. Taking too much in supplement form in a bolus could be problematic. The other caveat to supplementation is it doesn't necessarily help the bones, Is calcium supplementation therefore fit in any dose for any specific population? Because I feel like, and you'd know better than me, this would have been a common recommendation by a family doctor, especially to women as they age, to maintain bone mass, to take calcium. Yeah, we know with good evidence that Calcium supplementation may have a very modest effect in the first year of supplementation, but not much beyond that. But once again, the the, the crime here is that the, my colleagues pay attention only to calcium and often don't pay attention to the other things that really matter in preserving bone health, magnesium, big role, restoration of lactobacillus roteri, a big role that the oxytocin. Restoration of other healthy gut microbes, other lactobacilli, bifidobacteria species that enhance calcium absorption. Uh, how about uh, exercising that stresses the axial spine and pelvis? That helps prevent um, uh, uh, um, osteoporosis and fractures. Maybe K2. K2 is a little uncertain. It does help for bone strength, not necessarily bone density. So if, if a woman takes vitamin K2, let's say 180 micrograms of the MK7 form of K2, she won't see an improvement in her bone density on a DEXA, but she'll have less fracture. So it's presumed that K2 somehow strengthens bones, maybe via the collagen component, but it doesn't increase bone density. So just a little clarification of thinking. Collagen helps strengthen bones, though once again, you won't see that in bone density testing. 
Bone density testing is a flawed method. It only tests stuff that adds to calcium in bone and mineralization of bone. It doesn't test for the strength of bone. That that has to change over time. But there's, there's going to be a replacement of bone density testing with bone strength testing. But an issue for future. So <clears throat> um, uh, rotorite, a big uh, advantage in, in preserving bone density. Collagen. So why would collagen work? Well, bone is largely collagen. And most modern people lead a collagen-free or uh, a reduced diet because we've been told, cut your fat and saturated fat. So most modern people have abandoned consumption of brain and tongue and heart and stomach and intestines rich in collagen. And so most people don't want to eat those things anymore, sadly. So uh, you can go to a collagen supplement. Why well, I would tell your listeners, don't fall for this nonsense talk of bone broth. If you enjoyed that clip, you're going to want to head over here and catch a full episode. I'll see you over there. No, there's nothing else that tracks with LDL cholesterol because it's not a real number. It's a fictitious number. It's obtained by something called the free to well calculation. The LDL cholesterol reducing franchise, statin drugs, PCSK9 drugs, all that stuff pay huge amounts.